So the, the top three bacteria are staph, strep, and then add any one you want. After uh, strep, probably pyogenes. I would think in terms of E. coli or Pseudomonas before getting into more esoteric bacteria. Uh, there are a lot of others that are very important, but if you learn them by their virulence factor or the, some key trigger word, then they become much more approachable. Welcome to the Inside the Board Study Smarter series dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed on your exam. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Inside the Board Study Smarter Series 2019 Step 1 Edition. I am Patrick Beeman, your host. That opening line was from Dr. Ken Rosenthal, who is a microbiology and immunology expert, author of Rapid Review, Microbiology and Immunology, and uh, one of the guests in one of our most popular episodes on the Inside the Boards podcast, the 20-Minute Immune Response, which has a companion uh, YouTube presentation you can check out on our YouTube page. At any rate, our goal today is to touch on some of the important factors or learning points related to the top three bacteria you should know for your boards. So we've got um, uh, some stuff covering E. coli, Staphylococcus, and Streptococcus species. We'll get right into it, but please stick around for the announcements at the end. And I'm going to keep saying it, the Inside the Board's iOS beta app. All our podcasts are there, meditations uh, designed for medical students, and of course, subscriptions to our All Audio Q Bank. So if these question dissections and audio-based questions help you, you can get a lot more of them through a subscription to our All Audio QBank. Plus, of course, it helps inside the boards, you know, keep the lights on or keep the mics on, I don't know, but it keeps something on for sure. At any rate, here, let's get started. A 21-year-old male presents to the ED with a one-day history of diarrhea and fever, he went to a picnic last night and ate two hamburgers. This morning, he awoke and had five episodes of bloody diarrhea. His temperature is 103 Fahrenheit, and his pulse is 115 beats per minute. His blood pressure is 94 over 50. Physical examination shows dry mucous membranes, and a stool culture grows a gram-negative rod that ferments lactose. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this condition? Is it A, Bacillus cereus, B, Clostridium difficile, C, enteroinvasive E. coli, or D, Staphylococcus aureus? And the correct answer here is C, enteroinvasive E. coli. All right, so what do you need to know about EIEC? Well, first off, it is a bacteria that causes a syndrome or, or clinical picture that's identical to Shigella or Shigellosis, namely a febrile profuse diarrhea or dysentery um, with blood in the stool. Now, what's important about this, and I think what confused me as a student or uh, was easy to mix up was the fact that there, there are a few bugs that present similarly but have different virulence factors and features. So with enteroinvasive E. coli, what you need to know is that it does not produce toxins, okay? Um, it does produce a syndrome that is identical to shigellosis, but it does so by damaging the intestinal mucosa through mechanical destruction. And in this one, outbreaks have been associated with um, hamburgers and, and unpasteurized milk, famously. Importantly, enteroinvasive E. coli, E. coli in general, does ferment lactose, and that'll become an important point in a minute. In the next question, Elizabeth is going to explain a little more in detail about these, but I want you to really understand the, the, the points I'm about to make. To review, EIEC produces no toxins but produces a clinical syndrome 
that is the same as sugalosis. It does ferment lactose. So this is different than shigella. Shigella does not ferment lactose, and it presents with that same bloody diarrhea, dysentery with fever, um, kind of clinical syndrome. But it does so through a toxin. How does it get the toxin in the cells? Um, it's through what's called a type 3 secretion system or an injectosome. So I think of this like when a ship docks with, with like the Death Star in Star Wars. Um, you know, there's this like tube that connects the uh, ship that's docking with the Death Star. And that way the stormtroopers and um, Jedi, Wookiees or whatever uh, can actually get into the other ship. Well, the injectosome is like a needle-like protein that kind of attaches to um, a host cell and the toxins that Shigella produces can be transferred into the cell and cause the clinical features that we see. So the Shiga toxin inactivates the 60S ribosome by removing adenine from our RNA. It's the same sort of thing that the Shiga-like toxin, which is part of the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, um, also does. So the shiga-like toxin or the shiga toxin enhances cytokine release, which is why it can lead, either of those can lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome. And, and notably, both shigella species and EHEC can do that. And notably, the serotype we're used to hearing, O157H7. I guess another differentiator that could be important to know is that Shigella has a, a very low inoculum required to cause disease. And the, the bug is acid stable, which is important because it's not killed by gastric acid if it's ingested. So keep it straight. Enteroinvasive E. coli directly invades the mucosa, destroying the cells of the GI tract, leading to uh, the dys dysentery that uh, we saw in this case. The bug causing these symptoms could have been Shigella, but in that case, it would have not fermented lactose, as mentioned in the vignette. And again, Shigella produces a toxin that mediates the clinical features. So there's Shiga toxin produced by Shigella. There's a Shigella-like illness produced by enteroinvasive E. coli. And then here's the part that we don't want to confuse. Enterohemorrhagic E. coli produces a Shiga-like toxin. And with the O157H7 subtype, which is often transmitted by undercooked meat or contaminated raw uh, leafy vegetables like spinach, the Shiga-like toxin can lead to the dysentery and, like Shigella, the hemolytic uremic syndrome with its triad of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute renal failure. So hopefully that helps you keep straight the difference between enteroinvasive E. coli with its direct invasion of the GI mucosa, but similar clinical presentation as shigellosis, as well as the difference between Shigella species, which does produce a toxin that mediates the dysentery-like clinical picture and enterohemorrhagic E. coli that produces a shiga-like toxin with that same sort of dysentery-type clinical picture, but with the added benefit, at least for your study purposes, of also having the potential to cause hemolytic uremic syndrome, just like shigella species all right, so there we go. Now here's Elizabeth with a, another question for you, and spoiler alert, it is mainly about E. coli species. Hello, I'm your host, Elizabeth Eman, and I'm back today with another one of our mini episodes for the microbiology portion of the Study Smarter series. Our question today is, a 23-year-old woman comes to urgent care because of two days of mild fever and painful urination. The patient states that she's been urinating more frequently and does not feel as though she's fully emptied her bladder. She denies seeing blood in her urine, abnormal discharge, fatigue, or increased thirst. She's not currently sexually active and states that she has a regular menstrual period. Physical examination is unremarkable. 
Urine culture detects the presence of a gram-negative rod bacteria. Which of the following virulence factors contributes to the pathophysiology of the most likely microorganism causing this patient's symptoms? And the choices are A, exotoxin A, B, IgA protease, C, P, pilus, D, P1 antigen, or E, protein A. And the correct answer is C, P, pilus. The patient in this question most likely has a UTI. We know this by the painful urination, more frequent urination, and the most common cause of UTIs is E. coli. E. coli is a gram-negative rod. It's part of the normal gut flora. Most E. coli strains are innocuous. However, several strains are pathogenic and can colonize the urinary tract. There's an enterotoxigenic form of E. coli. That's the E. tech. Enteropathogenic, which is EPEC, enteroinvasive, which is EIEC, and enterohemorrhagic, which is EHEC. E. coli has several different virulence factors. Pili is just one of them. It also has a K capsule, lipopolysaccharides in the membrane. Uropathogenic strains that cause urinary tract infections express a specific P pilus, which binds to GAL14 on uroepithelial cells and allows the bacteria to colonize the bladder. Infection typically occurs when the urethra is exposed to fecal bacteria. The bacteria eventually reach the bladder and, depending on severity, may reach the kidneys. Because women have a shorter urethra, they are more susceptible to infection. Women with a urinary tract infection typically present with painful urination, dysuria, and mild fever. Medical history and laboratory studies can confirm the diagnosis. Treatment is with antibiotics. To review quickly the other wrong answer choices you might have been tempted by, we have exotoxin A. You may remember exotoxin A is a virulence factor released by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It functions by inactivating elongation factor 2 and results in host cell death. Remember, elongation factor 2 is part of DNA replication. Something that you should know about Pseudomonas, other than that it creates exotoxin A, is that it is known to have a blue-green pigment. It has a fruity odor when it's grown in the lab. And also, it is an encapsulated organism like many of our other bacteria, it uses that as one of its virulence factors, that capsule. The other organisms we know of that have capsules include Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitidis. Remember, people without spleens are especially susceptible to infections with encapsulated organisms. Choice B, IgA protease, that is an enzyme secreted by several different bacteria, Strep pneumoniae, H. influenzae type B, and Neisseria. The IgA protease is the virulence factor that's used in order for these bacteria to colonize the respiratory tract and create pneumonia. The P. pilus we already discussed, that was choice C, and the correct answer associated with the E. coli and its virulence factors. Choice D, the P1 antigen. The P1 antigen is the primary virulence factor for mycoplasma. Mycoplasma genitalium can infect the urethra, so that can be a little bit tricky. But it doesn't really infect the bladder. For this reason, we don't classify it usually as a urinary tract infection. It could have had these similar symptoms, certainly. However, the vignette describes the bacteria as a gram-negative rod bacteria. Mycoplasma is actually one of the bacteria that doesn't have a cell wall. For that reason, it doesn't really gram stain. So we would never hear a description of it being a gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria. The other ones that don't gram stain well include treponema, legionella, rickettsia, chlamydia, bartonella. These all don't gram stain well. We do know mycoplasma is a very common cause of atypical pneumonia. Choice E, protein A, is a virulence factor expressed by Staph aureus. It binds the FC region of IgG and prevents opsonization and phagocytosis. And we have a whole episode that we've already talked a lot about Staph aureus. Recommend checking that one out. The things you should know about E. coli are that there are different strains that act in different ways. So let's run through them really quick. E. hec enterohemorrhagic E. coli has a shiga-like toxin that is an rRNA, reverse RNA, and it enhances cytokine release, causing hemolytic uremic syndrome. Unlike Shigella, which can also cause this, EHEC doesn't invade host cells. So that would be the difference pathogenically of how those two work. 
For enterotoxigenic E. coli, it produces a heat labile and a heat stable toxin. The heat labile toxin overactivates adenylate cyclase, increasing CAMP, and increases chloride secretion into the gut. Where chloride goes, water will follow. Water goes into the gut and there's lots of diarrhea. Making this worse is the heat stable toxin, also released by ETEC. That overactivates guanylate cyclase, increases CGMP, and decreases resorption of sodium chloride salt from the gut, and therefore more water stays in the gut, makes the diarrhea even worse. So remember, watery diarrhea is a labile in the air, labile in air, adenylate cyclase, and stable on the ground. Stable goes with G for ground, goes with guanylate cyclase. E. coli is a gram-negative rod. It has multiple different virulence factors, including fimbri that can lead to cystitis, even pyelonephritis with the P. pili. has a K capsule, which leads to pneumonia, can cause neonatal meningitis, it has an LPS endotoxin, which leads to septic shock, and the different presentations of the different strains, E. I. E. C., has microbes that invade intestinal mucosa and cause necrosis and inflammation. This is invasive and leads to dysentery. Looks like Shigella. E-TEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli, produces the heat label and heat stable enterotoxins. Doesn't have any inflammation and no invasion of cells. Causes the watery traveler's diarrhea. E-PEC doesn't produce a toxin at all. It adheres to apical surfaces, flattens the villi, and prevents absorption. This leads to diarrhea, usually in kids. You can remember P for peds, P for EPEC, and EHEC is the one associated with that 0157H7, the most common serotype in the U.S., and leads to dysentery-like diarrhea. The toxin alone causes necrosis and inflammation, and it's hemorrhagic, um, transmitted through hamburgers, and can lead to hemolytic uremic syndrome, like Shigella does. So that's E. coli. Okay, and next is an example from our All Audio Q Bank. Again, please go download the app. A 19-year-old man presents with a four-day history of boils on his right leg, fever, and malaise. The patient is a competitive cyclist and reports using a razor he found in the locker room to shave his legs before a race. Skin examination shows three raised, warm, erythematous lesions with a central point extruding pus. Gram stain in culture reveals catalase positive, gram positive cocci. The bacteria also tests positive for the MEC A gene. The physician writes a prescription for an oral antibiotic. Which of the following would be an appropriate antibiotic to treat this patient's infection? Is it A, amoxicillin, B, linazolid, C, nafcillin, or is it D? Vancomycin. The correct answer is B, linazolid. This patient has a bacterial infection causing the lesions on his leg. Based on the lab findings showing catalase positive gram positive cocci, the causative organism is Staph aureus. The culture was positive for the MEC A gene, indicating the bacteria produced mutant penicillin binding proteins also called peptidoglycan transpeptidase, which does not bind most beta-lactams, including penicillins and cephalosporins. Since an oral antibiotic is prescribed, linazolid is the correct choice, as vancomycin is only given intravenously. And the board's insider tip for this one is, vancomycin and linazolid both use a mechanism that does not target the peptidoglycan transpeptidase of the bacterial cell wall. Vancomycin works by inhibiting the synthesis and polymerization of peptidoglycan for the bacterial cell wall, and linazolid binds to the 50S subunit of the bacterial ribosome and prevents the initiation complex. Vancomycin is only given intravenously, but linazolid is an oral antibiotic that can be used in an outpatient setting. And finally, one more from our All Audio QBank which is conveniently located in our app. See all these less than subliminal messages? A patient with endocarditis has a blood culture performed. The isolated organism is gram-positive, non-hemolytic, and exhibits no growth when exposed to 6.5% sodium chloride. 
Which of the following additional issues is associated with this organism? Is it A, drug abuse, B, dental caries, C, malignancy of the lower GI tract, or is it D, urinary tract infection? The correct answer is C, malignancy of the lower GI tract. Infective endocarditis by Streptococcus bovis is often associated with colorectal cancer. This is in contrast to Enterococcus, which can cause urinary tract infections as well as infective endocarditis. The test to differentiate between Enterococcus and Strep bovis is growth in 6.5% sodium chloride, which will be positive only for Enterococcus. All right, that's all we got for today. Up next, we're deciding whether to, to, to release musculoskeletal or cardiology for the Study Smarter series first, eh, but it'll be one of those. But we'll figure it out and, of course, let you know. Go to bit.ly slash paymyusmle and learn about the contest that we have going on for the next two months uh, until July where you could win a free USMLE or Comlex exam, which sounds like a terrible prize, right? So the actual prize is um, payment for your exam registration fee for one student uh, amongst the top three winners who perform certain actions to help promote inside the boards and or do certain actions, tell us about them that help them live their lives with balance. So one student from the top three winners each uh, month uh, we'll win that grand prize in our random drawing. And then finally, just to mention, please go search Physiology by Physio, our newest podcast for more high-yield learning related to especially your dedicated prep time for Step 1 or the Comlex Level 1. And I'm Audi.